because I was told by indirection that you've got the numbers. I'm going to look at you. The numbers of dollars. Oh, the cost. The cost. What does it cost to treat uh, an SS patient throughout his or her life compared to the cost, potentially, of, of gene therapy or transplant? Well, so we, we, there, there is a wide range, and I think that's the other key piece of this, is that there are some people who can go through their lives with minimal costs, um, and there are some people who have, uh, you know, just outstanding costs. Uh, there was a release, I think it was from AHRQ, that talked about billions of dollars that were spent in um, like 2016, that the admission rates have gone up 40% um, in the last few years. And so we do know that there is a large amount of cost from acute care utilization associated with this disease, but it's not for everyone, right? There are, there are patients who, who, who rarely seek care, they see their primary care doctor once a year, they see their hematologist once a year, and they, and they do well. And I think our responsibility is to identify those people for which these expensive therapies are most appropriate. How much, how much do we anticipate a, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I 100% agree. There's also the cost that's not measurable in dollars, and that's, that's right. the cost to quality of life of the individual living with sickle cell disease and their caregivers, and some of this is quantifiable. Uh, lost days of school and progression towards one's goals academically if you're a child born with sickle cell disease, being a parent of an individual with sickle cell disease and having some missed days from work, some of that is quantifiable. Uh, and if we could change the course of this disease and we could have kids born with sickle cell disease have some curative intent or cur curative therapy and they could live disease free, they would then have more productive lives and that would feed back into our economy. You know what's uh, exciting to me? We're sitting at a table, we are talking about sickle disease and at this, in this conversation the word cure has actually popped up. Yes. Right. And I mean, this is a first. It's a first. Yeah, yeah. I didn't think within my clinical yeah. career I would ever see this. So when you say it's exciting, couldn't agree with you more. I think it's very exciting, but I've heard, and I think in this case there are more cures, but I've got to tell you, I've been around a long time, and I've heard cure a long time. And so the cyanate, the urea, there are a lot of drugs that were coming out, and, 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 and so what I'm concerned about, I do think these are disease-modifying therapies, but most of the patients don't get comp care that will sustain their life that's available. And so it isn't a choice, which I've heard of, well, we can't provide care for them, so let's give them these therapies. We really need, there are a lot of standard medical care um, techniques that will provide improvement in outcomes and quality of life, as, and as well as survival. That should be the infrastructure as they All make right. decisions. So, so don't just, we ahead. have to have those things too. I completely agree, and I made a note here, supportive care. That made a difference in ALL. Mm -hmm. In mm -hmm. children, ALL today, 90% survival, right? A lot of that is supportive care. Okay, well, let me take the reductio ad absurdum, if I may, which is, let's presuppose I have a patient with severe SS disease, all right? This patient gets tremendous care, integrated into the system, gets everything that we can throw at this disease. With that, what's the estimated lifespan? I don't know that we have an exact number, but Elliot said yeah. earlier that it, in his well, yeah. opinion, this could be into the 60s, well, right? It, there are paper, it, you can't, there are risk factors for each patient. If you look at aggregate data, the sad news is really within the 40 survival rate um, versus the 60% 60-year 60 survival rate that was reported in London and some of the centers in the United States um, are, are out there. Um, and, but each individual patient has risk factors. So you can have a child who's never had any problems doing well, and then they have a catastrophic stroke, and then their um, care, and now we can keep them alive, but then they go on for a long time. So, you know, I, so, but basically I think with supportive care, the lifespan as an aggregate group would be around 60 if it was done correctly. So since the, but not quality of life. Well, no, quality I, yeah, of I mean, life. Could That's the no, I mean, they may survive longer, but they're still so, going to have multi-organ failure. There are failure. two ways to take the next question, which is, is the incremental life expectancy from 60 to, let's say, whatever the average life expectancy in America is in the mid-80s, 
that let, let's, I agree, it's quality. The added 20 years. Is that 20 years on a cost-effective basis, and boy, that's a tough question, uh, worth the money of transplant or gene therapy? It depends. Right? Yeah. It depends. <laughs> it's I mean, well, question. but it's right. I, I mean, there's such morbidity associated with this right. disease uh, right. that. So let's right. let's let's not take question. the meatball of life expectancy. Let's modify life expectancy by quality of life, which one can suppose over the years with micro infarcts and everything else, even with the best of care, gets worse and worse and worse and worse. So even if you're out to 60, 70, 80, your life's getting worse. Yeah, you may be on dialysis, you've had right, two hip replacements, right. yeah. you're unemployed. So you've got all that costs things. money too, mm -hmm. right? So at the end of the day, even if you increase life expectancy, you're increasing cost. And to some degree, if you increase life expectancy because of increased life expectancy, you're increasing cost of care. Right? Well, so if you're increasing I mean. life expectancy yeah. by because curing you, somebody, how is that adding to cost? Well, well, the, cost the cost of care of sickle, <laughs> specifically. If you didn't give them curative therapy. Yes. That cost needs to be bundled in. I'm trying to get a way to balance this. My, my personal sense is if you can make the cost of transplant or gene therapy rational, whatever rational may be, mm -hmm. as defined as the cumulative cost going out over the next 40, 50, 60 years, doesn't it favor early intervention curative? Yes, I, I get it now, yes, and, yes. And I think what we need is good simulation, uh, good a a uh, analysis, uh, cost-effectiveness analysis that we haven't done one, a very good yeah. one that would simulate If the studies the prove to do what we think they are, there's no question in my mind that, and I would do, and I would intervene very early in life. Mm -hmm. right. So the questions for me is, uh, the question about cost in a lot of ways is, a little bit upsetting for me because we have not done anything for this disease. If these drugs really work the way we expect them, that would be a no-brainer for me to do all of those therapies.